Hey there, I am going to go ahead and get started going through chapter four notes. I'm just going to do chapter 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3 for right now. And so this is continuing what we're learning about ecology. It's going to talk about communities, how they develop, um, the abiotic factors that are going to impact how they develop, and the how the type of organisms that can live there um, based on that, and also the interactions of the organisms when they live there. Okay, so first we will start with weather and climate. So obviously one of the big abiotic factors that you have to think about are going to be um, what the weather's like in the climate. So we know um, that, well, first of all, let me start with the difference between weather and climate. And I think this is kind of a big deal that you need to understand. A lot of people don't understand it. And so they make comments about things like climate change and they sound kind of like not real smart because you can tell they don't know the difference between the two. So it's really important that you know the difference. So weather is going to be the day to day conditions um, in a place. So it's sunny today. It could be rainy tomorrow. It could be um, hot and humid today and cool and dry tomorrow. Those daily day to day conditions that's weather and it's going to change and it's going to vary. You're going to see some fluctuations, some spikes that are going to be different than usual. You might get a random snowstorm in Savannah, Georgia. And that's weather though from day to day. Now climate refers to the overall long-term periods. You're looking at averages. So you're going to look at average temperature, average precipitation, things like that over a long period of time. And that's going to give you the climate. So again, you may see some random things um, happen like a random snowstorm or um, abnormally high temperatures or something like that. And that's weather. And you know, when it happens day to day, the average, the long term, that is going to be the climate. Um, so when you look at a certain region, it's not always going to be completely uniform. You can't look at southeast Georgia from mid Georgia to the coast and expect it to be the same temperatures all the way through. There are going to be different things that are going to affect um, certain areas like along the coast. It tends to be a little cooler because of the breeze off of the water it tends to cool things. Or if you go 50 or 60 miles inland, it tends to be hotter. So we call that a microclimate whenever you have those small variations. All right, so some of the things that are going to be a big deal kind of when it comes to determining the climate of an area is going to be where it's located on the earth um, because the sun hits it in a different way depending on where it is. So, um, you know, obviously some sun, oh, remember that's where we get all of our energy for life, right? But we also get the heat that we need from the sun um, and the way our atmosphere is set up, it kind of allows us to live on Earth because we do have a way to um, absorb or take in some of that heat and let some of it reflect back out. And that kind of gives us that nice balance, that perfect in between where um, we need to survive. All right, so the greenhouse effect is what does that. So it's just like whenever you park your car somewhere out in the sun when it's cold outside. So the radiant energy can pass right through the glass. So think of the glass as being like our greenhouse gases, which are gonna be carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor. Those are the primary ones um, in our atmosphere. So think of your car windshield as that. The sun can easily, that radiant energy can easily pass back through and then it hits the seats of your car. I have black seats, so this really happens where whenever it hits the seats, it warms it up. That black really absorbs that heat. It heats the car up. And now the heat energy can't get back out past the glass. It can't pass through. Heat energy can't pass through like radiant energy does. So it builds up inside of that and causes it to warm. And that's what the greenhouse effect does. So that's what warms our atmosphere. Um, so as we've had this excessive buildup of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, it's one of the things that's contributed to climate change because we have um, a lot of greenhouse gases um, and that is causing that flow, um, the removal of it, like allowing some of it to escape back out, it's not doing that. So it's just building up and it's slowly warming um, our, our environment over time. So you can look at the climate change data. You can look at it and you can see over a period of 100 years in different areas, you can look at average temperatures and they are steadily increasing and increasing as we are putting out more greenhouse gases. So that's going to have a big impact on ecosystems.
All right, the closer you are to the equator, obviously, you're going to have more direct sunlight here. So it's coming in, it's direct, as opposed to the poles where it comes in at an angle, so it's real spread out. You don't get as concentrated the energy. So that's why it's warmer at the tropical regions than it is at the poles, just because of the way the Earth um, is curved and how the radiant energy hits it. Um, yeah, so, and that's how we get our three climate zones through the middle here. That is our tropical. We have our temperate through here, and then right around here at the ends, um, those are poles. So between this 66.5 um, to 90 degrees north and south latitude, those are both polar. We have our temperate area between 23.5 and 66.5, both north and south. That gives us the temperate. And then right there from um, zero degrees to 23.5 degrees north and south, that's the tropical band. Um, so I would know the difference between those three zones and sort of be able to label them maybe on a map. Okay, so heat distribution. So um, the way the wind, the way the earth moves, the way the sun hits the earth, um, it's all going to um, cause these currents. And so you're going to have wind currents and currents in the water. Basically, I don't know if you know this, but cold things tend to be denser, and so they sink. And then warm things are less dense because those energy molecules are moving around more, and so they float. So that is water and air. Um, an air mass that is cold those molecules are more densely packed and they sink. As they warm up, they spread out and they go up. And so that causes a current and that happens in the atmosphere and it also happens in oceans. So that's how we get um, ocean currents and that's how we get wind currents and how fronts move and that's how we distribute this heat across the globe. Um, so this slide basically is just saying what I said about water sinking um, at polar regions, warm water is rising at the um, tropical zones, and that's going to cause all of these different um, currents that we see that move the water around the face of the earth. And the same thing happens with air masses as well. All right, so whenever an organism um, I say when they're trying to decide where to live, it's not like they get to decide, um, but an organism or a species, in order to be able to live in an area, they have to have um, specific conditions. We call that range. It's tolerance, so what it can tolerate in terms of environmental conditions. Um, so its tolerance for environmental conditions is going to determine its habitat, so that's where it lives. Um, so like a... Um, Arctic fox, well, its tolerance is going to be for colder areas because if you put it into a tropical environment, it's going to get too hot. It's going to be overheated. It's not going to be very successful. So its habitat is determined by its tolerance, which has a lot to do with its physiology. And then where it lives and its role is called its niche. So sort of how it interacts with the biotic and abiotic factors in the ecosystem is the niche of that organism. Where it lives is the habitat and sort of how it lives there is its niche. So think of it that way. All right, so resources. Um, we know what resources are. Water, nutrients, light, food, space. Um, and those things are also going to determine where an organism can live, is the availability of resources. But that's also going to cause competition. So organisms will fight with each other. Um, and, and how they interact with each other is an important part of defining its niche. Um, so competition is going to happen when there is limited resources in a place um, and you're going to see different types of competition. So um, intrust specific is going to be um, members of the same species competing for things. Inter specific are multiple populations that are going to compete. Um, and you might not even think about it, but even plants, they compete for resources. They're competing for water. They're competing for sunlight. They can want to grow taller and, and have more access to the sun. They want to have roots that grow deeper and able to bring in more water. So they will actually compete as well. So it's not just animals that are going to compete for these resources. Um, there is something called the competitive exclusion principle, which basically says that no two species can live in the same niche, in the same habitat at the same time, that basically one or the other is going to out-compete the other for these limited resources and the way a lot of organisms will kind of um, they will make up for that is by resource partitioning and so basically that just means they divide resources so here we have this um, 
we have this tree. Let me move this over a little. All right, so here we have this spruce tree, and then we have three different species of these birds. They're called warblers. They all live in the same area, and they eat like the same types of things, but they literally are found in different areas. You find them in different areas of the same tree. So um, this one will live in this area. Then you'll have this one that kind of lives in the middle, and then this one that will live towards the bottom. So they divide those resources. Um, they do not occupy the same niche. There's too much competition, and they will fight each other. And so it has just developed to where this is their niche, and they do what we call resource partitioning, which is just dividing resources. All right, so some interactions, you know a lot of these. Predation, so predators hunt down prey, kill them and eat them. Obviously, that's going to impact the size of not only the um, prey's population, but depending on the amount of prey around, it's going to determine the size of the predator. So that interaction um, is going to have a big impact on the ecosystem. Um, herbivory, you might not think about it, but herbivores also play a big role in how well plants um, can live, like where they live, how they grow. So in, I think of it a lot as predation, where a predator is hunting and killing an animal and eating it. Well, herbivores are hunting down and killing and eating. Um, I mean, they don't really have to hunt them down, they're there, but they have to find them, get access to them, and then they eat them and kill them. And so um, it's very much, very similar to predation. All right, so a keystone species is one organism that if you remove it, it can have a huge impact on a community. Um, so I wrote that you don't have to write it down, but we're not taking notes right now, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so this is an example that happened up in the Pacific Northwest. So the way it works in the ecosystem up there is that the sea otters eat the sea urchins, sea urchins eat the kelp. Okay, so, um, you know, a couple decades ago, the sea otters were being hunted and hunted and hunted and almost completely wiped out. And that caused the sea urchin po population to just bloom. Um, and it just went crazy. Well, next thing you know, the sea kelp, the forests, um, they're called kelp forest, were completely almost decimated um, because there were so many sea urchins that they just ate everything in sight, all of the sea kelp. Well, when you did that, you start taking away ecosystems for the whole um, area. So the birds that would nest in the top of the kelp and all of the other fishes and the other organisms that lived in that kelp forest were impacted because you removed this one keystone species, which were the sea otters. And eventually the, the numbers kind of rebounded once people stopped eating them, or excuse me, stopped hunting them. So whenever they um, the numbers rebounded, you saw the sea urchin population go down and that allowed the kelp forest to regrow. So they were the keystone species there that once you removed it, there was a big change in the ecosystem. Um, you know, I'm going to stop it right here and then I'm going to get into symbiotic relationships in the next video. I just don't want to make it too long. So um, I'll stop here and I'll pick it back up on another video.